be streaming live on Facebook and uh, also on YouTube, Proverbs Live. We'd be glad to have you join us. We're continuing our series this morning on the subject of the scientific evidence that supports our faith in creation. As we compare the evidence, looking at the evidence for and against creation, evolution, uh, I think we find very encouraging evidence for those who are Christians. There are a lot of people who look at the fossil record and uh, are somewhat intimidated, thinking uh, this is supposed to be telling us about evolution. And when we look at the fossils, I think we see exactly the opposite. If I have a chance to lecture on the college campus or to debate, which I do from time to time, this is the subject I want to talk about. I enjoy talking about the fossils. This is the critical evidence. This is what's indicated by S.M. Stanley of Johns Hopkins University, one of the more famous paleontologists in the world. He says it's doubtful whether in the absence of fossils, the idea of evolution would represent anything more than an outrageous hypothesis. Now, I'd like for, to, for you to remember that. Uh, without the fossils, this, this leaves them without a leg to stand on. It's an outrageous hypothesis. Well, I don't think they have the fossils. I think the fossils testify against them. He continues saying, the, rec the fossil record, and only the fossil record, provides direct evidence of major sequential changes in the Earth's biota. If you're going to prove it, this is where it's at. This is the only direct evidence. But as we look at the direct evidence that he refers to here of the fossil record, it, it, we need to be reminded that this, this is not direct evidence in the primary sense. This is a historical record. Scientific evidence that provides proof is evidence that you can repeat and test, experiment with. That's not the case with history. And when we're dealing with fossils, we're talking about historical record. Uh, John Horner, one of the more famous paleontologists in the world, if you saw the movie Jurassic Park, it was his life that the paleontologist Alan uh, Grant portrayed in the movie. He says, paleontology is a historical science, a science based on circumstantial evidence after the fact we can never reach hard and fast conclusions. Now, that's case, the case with, with history. Uh, it's easy these days, he says, to go through school for a good many years, sometimes even through college, without ever hearing that some uh, sciences are historical or by nature inconclusive. Now, this is the only direct evidence, but even at best, it's not absolutely conclusive because of the nature of historical science. Uh, Jerry Cohn makes this point. He's one of the most vicious anti-creationists <laughs> in the world from the University of Chicago, professor of biology. He says, evolutionary biology is a historical science uh, laden with history's inevitable imponderances. Uh, we evolutionary biologists cannot generate a Cretaceous part to observe exactly what killed the dinosaurs. You can't observe, test, experiment, he said. Uh, we usually cannot resolve issues with a single simple experiment. Now that's the nature of historical science and the nature of the fossil record. Ernst Mayer of Harvard, uh, one of the more representative evolutionary biologists in the world, uh, says evolutionary biology in contrast to physics and chemistry is a historical science. The evolutionary attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Uh, laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques. Now, so often you hear, well, this is absolute proof. This is a fact and uh, they just don't know the nature of the evidence. The only direct evidence is the fossil record, and it is inconclusive by nature. 
uh, instead of uh, one constructs historical narrative contrasting uh, in contrast to a, uh, the, the tentative reconstruction, consisting of tentative reconstructions. We need to understand this is the nature of the evidence. But looking at that evidence, we do get strong indications, I think, not conclusive proof, but strong indications, historical evidence, uh, regarding creation and evolution when we look at the fossils. But how do we look at the fossils and see evolution or creation? How, how do you tell? I mean, there are dead things in the rock. Uh, is it there by evolution, creation? Which, which is supported? How do we know? Well, one of the ways that we test hypotheses would be by making predictions. And there are very obvious contrasting predictions when we uh, consider the concepts of creation and evolution. If creation were true, we ought to see this. If evolution were true, we ought to see that. Uh, especially when you look at the beginning, uh, they're very obvious contrasting uh, predictions. Uh, a simple, gradual, linked beginning would be the prediction of the evolutionist when we look at the beginning of the record, here's the, what we ought to see. On the other hand, uh, the creationist says, no, it ought to be complex and abrupt and diverse right from the start. Now, I don't think we're looking at a record of creation. I think we're looking at a fossil record, that is, a, a flood deposit. Uh, but it ought to be complex and abrupt and diverse right from the start with critters that lived at the bottom of the ocean, but not the simple gradual progression that would be predicted by the evolutionist. There should be an allied continuum, a progression upward. And on the other hand, uh, stasis would be the order of the day. That is the opposite of continuing evolution. It stays the same, distinct, separate. Now, those are very different predictions. We should simply be able to look at the evidence and see which one is served best. Uh, another factor would be uh, uh, similarities, and this is really the, probably the most important factor when you look at the fossil record. How do you know evolution or, uh, well, you see similarities and you're able to line up the progressions. There are predictions made by both creationists and evolutionists regarding similarities. A branching pattern gradually developing uh, the nested tables, uh, the hierarchy, would be the prediction of the evolutionist, whereas uh, the, the creationist would predict similarities based on a common designer creating similar forms for similar functions, but not this branching pattern, a blue tile where the mosaic designer wants it, another blue tile there, but not the branching pattern. So again, we should be able to look at the nature of the similarities and see which one is served best by the evidence. But I can tell you the similarities are a mosaic pattern and it's abrupt and sudden right from the start and you might say well now you're prejudiced, you're creationist and of course the same thing would be true of the evolutionist but let's just give the evolutionist the advantage and allow them to describe the nature of the evidence. The quotes we want to remind everyone are from antagonistic witnesses. Now, this is confusing to some people. You're not being fair. You're uh, quoting from people who don't agree with you. Well, but when they acknowledge the difficulties, that's really better evidence. Testimony from a friendly witness, the accused is honest, no reasonable, that'll help, but he's a friend. Uh, you expect him to say that, but the antagonistic witness, if he admits, yes, the accused is honest, there's no reasonable, this is better evidence. Uh, judicially, this is referred to as acknowledgments contrary to interest. If you admit it when you really don't want to, uh, this is powerful evidence, and that's the kind of evidence that we're using quotes from antagonistic witnesses, and I'm not misrepresenting them. They are devout believers, but they're believers in evolution. They are men of great faith, but faith in evolution. 
One example of that would be Richard Dawkins, uh, one of the more famous evolutionists, uh, certainly an antagonistic witness. What does he say about the beginning of the fossil record? Right down at the bottom, at the start of this geologic column that we've talked about in previous sessions, he says, we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. Now, how do you know it's a state of evolution if, boom, that's the first time they appear? Well, that, I think that reflects a prejudice, but nevertheless, he's a, a expressing the nature of the record. It's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Now, he has faith that there was an evolutionary history, but it's not in the fossil record according to this antagonistic witness. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted the creationist. Uh, that's another way of saying it meets their predictions. This is exactly what they expect, and I'll plead guilty. Yep, that's, that's delightful. Uh, though I am determined to follow the evidence, this uh, is very obvious. And this is what the antagonistic witness says. National Geographic describes the beginning of the record as the explosion of life, the Cambrian period. This is the lowest level as it's arranged by the geologic column. Consider the description by Stephen Gould, uh, who for years uh, wrote in Nature a, a regular column uh, and uh, in Natural History. He says, the Cambrian explosion occurred in a geological moment now, this is the description of the beginning of the record. It's an explosion. We have reason to believe, uh, uh, think that all major anatomical designs may have made their evolutionary appearance at that time. Now, boom, it's an explosion. All the anatomical designs are there. Now, he uses the word design. I, it, he doesn't mean that, but <laughs> it slipped out. There it is, right there, and it's an evolutionary appearance. Now, if it appears as an explosion with no evolutionary history and all the anatomical designs, the major phylum, all are there, I, it doesn't look like an evolutionary history, but he has faith that that's what it is. Not only the phylum chordata, that's the ones with backbones, that's us, including us, but all the major divisions. So here is the highest order, according to the evolutionist. That's right at the beginning. All of its major divisions, all the major anatomical designs, according to the leading paleontologists, are one of them. Uh, he says this is, of course, contrary to Darwin's expectations. Uh, in other words, this is not what's predicted, according to the evolutionist. Now, I don't think there's a whole lot of trouble figuring out which model is served best by this evidence. But it gets worse for the evolutionist. He says, since the so-called Cambrian explosion, no new phyla of animals have entered the fossil record. So boom, they're all there from the start, and no new ones since. Now, does that look like an evolutionary record? <laughs> Not at all. Maxwell Maltz of the University of Texas at Austin says the Cameron explosion wasn't, uh, was not, should have been, but was not a gradual development of complexity. Now, that's what's predicted, but it was not. These things suddenly burst out of a magic box. Now, that may sound like a creationist, but I assure you he is not. But that's what the fossil record is, as the evolutionists acknowledge. Uh, Eugene Conan is uh, certainly uh, one of the leading representatives today, uh, more up to date. Uh, Gould was writing back in, in the 80s, and then we see Maltz. And now then, Coonan here in 2007, uh, he's with the National Center for Biotechnology and Information that produced the sequencing of the human genome. Uh, 
one of the more representative scientists in the country. He updates, maybe, maybe we've learned more since Gould made his statements. The Cambrian explosion in animal evolution during which all the diverse body plans appear to have emerged almost in a geological instant. That's exactly what Gould said, and it hasn't gotten any better. The relationship between animal phyla remains controversial and elusive. Now, boom, there they are. How did one lead to the other? Well, I don't know, there they are, boom. All the plans in a geological instance. An instance. Uh, then even more updated here from 2012 from evolutionary biology. Fossils from the Cambrian period can cause a real headache for evolutionary biologists. They expect, they predict, this is the way you do science, you make predictions, the, they expect simple organisms evolving over time to become increasingly more complex. However, during the Cambrian explosion, there was an apparent explosion of different major groups of animals, all appearing simultaneously in the record. Morphological variety of living, uh, it, this is comparable to what we have today when we first encounter them in the Cambrian fossil record. <sighs> Gould, <laughs> uh, Maltz, uh, Kunin, here 2012, let's just update it to 2018 from geology, making sure this hasn't changed with more discoveries. The fossil record of the early animals uh, has documented an early Cambrian explosion of metazoan body plans, evidenced by the stratigraphic first occurrence of fossils, almost all animal phyla in the early Cambrian. Now, this is exactly what we would predict. Uh, boom, there it is, almost all the plans. Uh, that's exactly what we expect. That's the opposite of what the evolutionists expect. This is the only direct evidence without the evidence of the fossils. It's an outrageous hypothesis, but when you look at it, certainly at the beginning, uh, this is a major challenge. Right down at the bottom, at the beginning of the fossil record, the Cambrian, it looks like it burst out of a magic box. It's complex. Suddenly, right at the start, a real headache, not the predictions they make uh, for evolutionary biologists. They're advanced, just planted without any evolutionary history. All the major anatomical designs, the chordata, all of its major divisions. <laughs> and then to rub salt in the wound since the Cambrian explosion, no new viola. Now, I don't have to tell you which model is served best. Maybe I need to remind you that these comments are not from creationists. These are from the antagonistic witnesses, the leading experts in the field of paleontology. And that's the picture, and it does not support evolution. The only major, the only direct evidence, <laughs> according uh, to the paleontologist from Johns Hopkins, Stanley, is uh, contrary and not supportive of the picture of evolution. But you look in the textbook, and this is what you see. You, you, you see this simple animal progressively getting more complex with the chordata, which is right at the bottom, up at the top. The prediction of progressions that uh, they expect is not there, but that's what they put in the textbook. Now, Stephen Rapp is uh, another one of the leading paleontologists in the country from the University of Chicago, uh, from the Chicago Field Museum. Uh, he says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. This was the prediction. In general, these have not been found. Uh, yet optimism has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into the textbooks. Now, this is the description of the evolutionist 
uh, from the largest fossil museum in the United States, Chicago Field Museum. What's in the textbooks is fantasy. Specifically, what's in the textbooks, these evolutionary trees that show the progression. Adorn our textbooks, Google says. They have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. However, the rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. Those trees do not come from the fossil record. In fact, it's just pretty much upside down. Gould, in his book, Wonderful Life, depicts it this way. He said there's a cone, uh, slow, gradual progression upward. That's what's predicted. He says the truth is it's actually upside down. It's opposite. He says they've turned the traditional interpretation on its head. They have inverted the cone. Uh, there's, there's no higher authority, the one who knows more about paleontology than Stephen Gould, but that's not the picture in the textbooks. They invert the cone with the fossils, but no, that's not the picture that they put in the textbooks. Well, where do they get this idea with the assumption of evolution? They believe it. Uh, in fact, it's described this way in the geology text, Evolution to the Earth. We have arranged the groups in a traditional way with the simplest forms first, progressively more complex groups following. This particular arrangement is arbitrary. It's not the fossils. It's in spite of the fossils. They have arranged it that way. Now, the arrangement is not because of the fossils, but it is not completely irrational. It's based on the assumption that he continues to describe on this page, and we want to be fair, arbitrary, but not, <laughs> he, he's somewhat overstating the case. Things are alike because they're related. Now, you look at cousins, they seem to be somewhat similar, brothers and sisters, you can, uh, okay, I understand that concept, and so the prediction is there would be similarities, yes, and we, we do see those. The less they look alike, the further removed they are from their common ancestor. And we look at some of the things in the fossil record, and uh, boy, you can't deny the similarity. That's just obvious. The question is why? Now, that question is not asked by the evolutionist. It's just asserted this is because of evolution. But it would possibly be explained as we see similarities, for example, in a subdivision. Uh, that's not because they're cousins or common genetics, that's because of a common designer, isn't it? A common designer would create similar forms for similar functions. That wouldn't be surprising. And so when we look at the architecture uh, of the, the, the mammals, the, the pendactyl form of the vertebrate hand, you see similarities. Now, again, evolutionists don't ask why. They just assert this is because of evolution. Well. I think we should ask why, and when we see that at least uh, there is an alternative explanation, common designer, common genetics would produce this form, but when we compare the two possibilities, we see significant problems. It's really a difficult thing to describe this in terms of common genetics because when we look at the genetics, especially at the, the embryo, we see they develop from different parts of the embryo. The newt comes from segments two through five. The lizard hand comes from segments six through nine. Man's hand from segments 13 through eight. Totally different genetics account for the vertebrate hand. And so common genetics is a problem. Sir Gavin DeVere, uh, who is a professor of embryology at Oxford, says uh, the attempt to find homologous genes has been hopeless. Uh, that's not really a very good explanation. Um, similarities are what we need to talk about when we're talking about the fossil record. Otherwise, they're just dead things in rocks. And by arranging them, uh, they present the picture in spite of the fact they're not arranged that way in the fossil record. We're told uh, that the chimpanzees and man are, are almost similar by Richard Dawkins in his 1986 book, uh, 
the watchmaker, blind watchmaker. That's a very outdated claim. Uh, our time is running out. We're going to have to continue this next time. But let's just notice from science, this is a myth, the 1% difference. Similarities are showing that humans and chimps are not as similar as many uh, think they are. They confound any quantification uh, of humanness and chimpness. The latest estimates from nature tell us they differ radically in sequence structure. Uh, here the chimp genome is 10 to 15 percent longer, but only 1 percent difference. 50 percent of the human genes were missing from the, uh, from the uh, chimp, one-third more gene categories, different, but 1 percent difference. Now that's just not so, and if somebody's telling you that, they're just ignorant or not telling the truth. Um, we're going to look at a number of other examples. Uh, I like to talk about similarities <laughs> along with the fossils, and the more you look at similarities, you see they do not fit any better than the fossils do. Uh, they present a challenge. <laughs> I believe we need to follow the evidence. I think science uh, supports, uh, well, we, I if you're not following the evidence, you're just not being honest. So we encourage people to do that. Uh, tune in next week when we'll look at the rest of this story. But we thank you for being with us this morning.